to Games as Lit 101. I think we can all agree that graphics don't make a game. That's not to downplay the importance of visuals, of course, they're quite important, but good visual design is always going to be far more important to a game than just having the highest resolutions and the most detail and most photorealistic look possible. As technology has advanced, this fact started to be forgotten. We started focusing on photorealism, on making everything as detailed as possible while our technology made us more and more capable of doing so. But every now and again, a game reminds us that detailed realism isn't the only way to make a compelling game with enjoyable characters. With indie hits like Braid and Limbo, cult classics like Okami, and bold visual experiments like Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, there are plenty of examples of games that enrapture us with gorgeous visuals through a level of simplicity and good visual design. But few are quite so simple, or so relatable, as Thomas Was Alone. Thomas Was Alone started off as a simple game inspired by the concept of friendship. Mike Bithell was doing a personal 24-hour game jam, and the result was a small browser-based game based on blocks of different shapes, sizes, and abilities. The game was later expanded into Thomas Was Alone, with a visual style inspired by minimalistic architecture movements such as German New Objectivity, and with a story inspired by the concept of a group of people bound together and trying to escape. And so, a simple game developed in 24 hours expanded to become a very well-received indie hit of 2013. The selling point for most people was quite simple. This game will make you care about its characters, despite the fact that these characters are just a bunch of multicolored blocks. Certainly an impressive sounding feat, though considering the visual fidelity of a lot of other characters we've fallen in love with in video games, certainly it makes enough sense. I think sometimes we get caught up in realism and forget that visual fidelity has nothing to do with good characters. Good storytelling and good writing makes for good characters, whether they're only made of 16 by 16 pixels, never speak, look girly, or even if they're just squares. Thomas Was Alone reminds us of that. But as you might imagine, there's far more to this game than just an experiment in the characterization of abstract objects. There's a story here too, and it, much like the visuals, uses minimalism to its advantage rather valiantly. So let's take a look at Thomas Was Alone and see how a bunch of colored blocks might just make you cry. Now that being said, you certainly will not cry if you just watch me summarize it. This is a full literary analysis and it has all the plot details ahead. This game is cheap on a number of platforms, it does not require a powerful computer to run, and it takes only 4 or 5 hours to play through. You can take the time to experience this one properly instead of using this analysis to spoil it for yourself ahead of time. So that out of the way, let's get going. We begin with a quote. The program was a failure. People forget this. It was a massive flop. The coders started adding name strings to the AIs as a joke. Thomas-AT-23-6-12 wasn't special. It was just an AI in the right place at the right time. The story we experience in the game also has a background in the form of these quotes. They give us insight into the events at the fictional company Artificial Life Solutions, when the events of the game were taking place inside of their mainframe. The characters we're about to meet are all inside a computer system. Then, we're introduced to Thomas himself. Thomas was alone. Well, a weird first thought to have. And that makes this the second game I've analyzed on this show with a better narrator than me. Thanks, Danny Wallace. If Thomas could be described in a single word, it would be curious. Thomas decided to start listing his observations for posterity. His first thought is simply the fact that no one is around him, and after that he's utterly excited to discover anything and anyone else he can. But we'll see more of that in a minute. At first, his existence is rather simple. He knows a single thing that could only be noted by a sentient being. He is alone, and begins listing his observations. Thomas wondered whether the portals were actually taking him anywhere. He felt like he was making progress, but there wasn't really any way to know. He seemed to be moving predominantly up and to the right, which might, or might not, be important. The simplicity of the character at first is important, for the same reason the simplicity of everything is important. Though some hard work obviously went into this game, as it looks, sounds, and plays rather beautifully, its design is quite simple, and that's on purpose. We'll see why as we continue. It doesn't take long for Thomas to meet his first companion, Chris. A little square who can't jump quite as high as Thomas, Chris is just upset that this annoying rectangle is now following him around and showing off his jumping skills. But they work together to get around, so Chris tolerates his presence. Just from how these two characters think and play off each other, we can get a fairly good picture of them. 
Chris thinks Thomas is just a big show-off, but really that's just an insecure reaction to Thomas's better jumping abilities. While Thomas obviously isn't trying to show off, he's just so energetically curious that he comes off as kind of obnoxious to the cynical little square. And that's a pretty good word to sum up Chris. Cynical. You'll find that most of these characters can actually be summed up pretty easily, but do not mistake that for a lack of complexity. Not only are they fully fleshed out characters in their own right, but their simplicity is actually quite purposeful, as I'll explain in a bit. They eventually run into John, who's quite narcissistic. John knew. He knew that this was his chance. A moment to shine. This was game day. He can jump really high, and he's very happy about how great he is. He helps Thomas and Chris mostly because he feels like he should be seen to help the little guy, and is generally quite obsessed with himself. Narcissism is really the most appropriate word for this character. Next we meet Claire. She's not in a good spot, and is facing certain death. So, this was how Claire would die. She knew it would happen eventually. She ponders on her worthless existence, lamenting that her large size and her small jump only ever got in the way, right until the end. She pretty firmly cements self-depreciation as her defining characteristic. But then, unlike any of the other AI in the game, she floats in the water. She immediately decides this is her superpower, and resolves to use it to protect the others around her. As you may have picked up on, the first while of the game is basically just Thomas picking up more and more friends as he journeys ever onward, without necessarily having a particular goal in mind, or really even knowing that there is a goal to be had. But that all changes when they meet Laura. Laura feels abandoned. Used. She's met plenty of others along her journey, and they always disappear once they've used her exceptional bounciness to reach higher places. So when she meets the others, she's cautious and untrusting, and separates herself emotionally from everyone in hopes that they could just have a normal relationship instead of using her. But it doesn't take long at all for her to like Chris, and she gets the feeling he likes her too. And indeed, Chris falls in love immediately, even if his insecurities keep him from expressing it. But Laura's also worried about this strange pixel cloud that's been following her around. You catch glimpses of it as you work your way through the levels, and she notes that it's always been around, even after all her friends have disappeared. From the quote at the beginning of the sequence, we gather that this is a protection built into the system to remove unwanted code. So they designed the system to release these splitters, seen in the game as a pixel cloud, to remove from play the very things that would eventually lead to the emergence of artificial intelligence. Life, uh, finds a way. And indeed, the pixel cloud starts doing its job, and Thomas is the first to go. Chris misses him, but doesn't have long before he's taken as well. Laura realizes what's happening, realizes that she was never abandoned, but that she was being used as bait, and realizes that she's not needed anymore. Claire, having lost three of her friends, vows vengeance upon her arch-enemy, the Pixel Cloud, but John knows fighting it would be futile. He only hopes he'll be the next one taken. He doesn't want to be alone. Lamenting the loss of his friends and the futility of his skill without an audience to appreciate it, he keeps going for old time's sake, until eventually he too is taken by the splitter. No, don't worry, that's not how it ends. What a depressing ending that would be. No, our heroes still have some work to do, and the splitter, as it turns out, didn't actually delete them. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could just make a program that deletes glitches automatically from a system? I can think of a good few recent games that would have loved to have a feature like that. But no, it just relocates them. It isolates them. Keeps them from joining together and compounding. This is when we're introduced to James. He's alone, and he likes it that way. He'd been taken by the Pixel Cloud too, and really was happy for it. The others he was with only ridiculed him for his unique disregard for Newtonian laws. James, unlike Thomas, willingly retreated into solitude. But when he sees Thomas looking confused and lost and trapped, he frees him and, to his surprise, they get along well and work well together. James appreciates having a friend who doesn't care about how different he is. Thomas continues in hopes of finding his friends, and they continue on until they meet Sarah. No, not that. 
well, actually, basically that's Sarah, now that I think about it. She's ridiculously pretentious, regarding Thomas and James as lesser beings because they do not possess the knowledge she does. She knows of the Fountain of Wisdom. She seeks it, seeks to understand this world and escape it. She spoke, in terms she could only hope they might understand, of the Fountain of Wisdom, the channel through which all data flowed. She had vowed long ago that she would know this world. She would know what this world was. That she, Sarah, would know how to escape. But in a cruel twist of fate, it's not Sarah who ends up at the fountain. It's Thomas. He looks into it and realizes its significance. Knowledge. All of it. And he enters. Thomas was connected to the internet for 12 seconds, and he had seen everything. He'd seen the cat who couldn't spell, he'd heard of the arrow through the knee. He felt there was probably a thing called cake, but that was a lie. Can I just say that I love how Thomas connects to the internet, basically the whole of human knowledge, and the noteworthy things that he takes away from it are lol cats and video game memes. I mean, I'd say that he's a petty little quadrilateral, but to be fair, that is basically the internet, so I, I can't say I blame him. The knowledge Thomas gains from the internet, knowledge of both the outside world and this system itself, reveals to him exactly what must be done and how. When they were taken by the pixel cloud, they were trapped. That was irreversible. But they could gain access to the creation matrix and shape the world themselves, at the cost of their own lives. His friends agree, all coming to their own personal reasons, which we'll discuss in a bit, to grant freedom to the other AIs in the system through their sacrifice. Around this time would be a good opportunity to explain what's going on in the physical world, what's happening practically from our human perspectives. This company, Artificial Life Solutions, is attempting to create artificial intelligence. Now obviously such a huge and complex program as they're creating would generate plenty of errors and little unintentional side effects. Those are our heroes. These random segments of code are generally handled by being placed in digital environments that are designed to be obtuse and arbitrary, to basically keep them busy in a separate place from the actual project. Thus, all the random puzzles and difficult terrain. The company had been trying to distract these little byproducts of the system so they could create a true artificial intelligence, without realizing these little glitches were the key to the evolution of AI. So by entering the creation matrix, Thomas and his friends are basically taking control of the system. They would cease to exist, and instead spread their variations into the digital world itself. In short, they've evolved, and would sacrifice themselves to spread their evolutionary traits throughout the system, altering it to the benefit of the other AI and giving them the abilities necessary to escape. And so, the first act of sentient AI is one of selfless sacrifice, as our seven heroes become the architects, dissolving into the system and spreading their influence throughout it. The splitters keep their distance, and the world grants the abilities of the architects to other entities in the system. In the physical world, it becomes clear that something big is happening, and artificial life solutions is evacuated, leaving everyone to simply wait and see what happens. And it's here that many say the story derails a bit, and you know what, the first time I played through the game I would have agreed with them, but a bit more analysis, and especially a second playthrough later, I really see the importance of this segment. That said, it's not necessarily because of the new characters we meet, as it is because of the implications it has to the original Seven and their sacrifice, so I'm gonna summarize it a bit more quickly. The original Seven are gone, but there is still a lot of other AI in the system, and thus there is still the issue of escape. The Architects have created zones within the world itself that temporarily grant other AI the same powers that the original Seven had, allowing them to make it to higher and further places. The Shifters had been placed in the world by the Architects, AIs who sacrificed themselves to fuel their escape. There was an outer world, a world beyond the confines of their universe. And so the player takes on more roles, all of characters who aren't so easily defined. Gray is excited at the possibility of escape, but his ambition leads him to actively hurt others to get to the exit. Paul could sense that the changes were deliberately created, and after sharing that information to inspire Gray, feels responsible for Gray's actions. 
There's also Joe and Sam, two AI who are simply following what the system is indicating and unwittingly end up endangering themselves by helping Gray. Paul ends up finding the eccentric Team Jump, and they help him get to Sam and Joe to warn them about Gray. Eventually, Paul saves Joe and Sam by leading Gray to a stray pixel cloud that hadn't gotten the memo to retreat, and Sam and Joe, running from the traitor and the pixel cloud, are left to become the first AI to emerge. They leapt. What we see in these last two sequences is a more complex story of characters that can't be quite so easily simplified. Because of the way Thomas Was Alone is written around character arcs, this sudden change is a bit jarring, but I think that's kind of the point. When Thomas and the others became the architects, they didn't just pass on their jumping abilities and relationships to gravity, they passed on their personality traits as well. This allowed the other AI in the system to suddenly become more full, aware, and complex beings, and this is displayed pretty perfectly in these final events. Now that we've gone over the story, we need to talk about what it means and how it relates to minimalism. Which means that we need to talk about what minimalism is and how it works. Minimalism is, as with most artistic movements, kind of hard to pin down definitively. A lot of different artists did a lot of different things with it, and the General characteristics that govern it are fairly fluid, aside from some rather broad concepts at the heart of the movement. But generally speaking, minimalism seeks to simplify something down to display its true core. Exactly what this means can vary between artists and works. Some minimalist sculptures, for example, do very little to change the basic materials they use in hopes of showing nothing more than the basic fact of what this sculpture is. Others, instead, may try and show the essence of something, in more of a spiritual or metaphysical sense, trimming something seemingly complex down to the very core of what it is. But through that, it often aims to allow us to further understand complexity. If you have an understanding of the individual parts, then you can have a better understanding of the whole. Minimalism parses something down to the very simple core of what it is, so that when you see its place in the bigger picture, you can have a better understanding and appreciation for it. And it's here that the simplicity of the Seven Architects becomes a really important element of the story. Minimalism is a core aesthetic of Thomas Was Alone in a number of different ways, and it's a fitting presentation for this story. Because the core, the essence of something that minimalism strives to put on display, is all these characters are. At the beginning of each scenario, we're given a quote by someone within the universe of the game. These paint a more full picture of the story, and give us a glimpse into the larger meaning these characters and their actions hold in the big scheme of things. One such quote reads, The initial group possessed simple variations in size and strength. More complex configurations were inevitable. As the error spread, these variations became increasingly extreme. Later in the game, we get another quote that says, Awareness is a word that gets thrown around a lot, and a lot of people consider Thomas to have been created aware. Looking back at the logs, it seems that awareness only happens somewhere around the network connection spike. These two quotes go a long way toward emphasizing a certain point of the story. These original seven characters are not full, true AI. They're fragments of a sort, bits of personality with few defining characteristics, sentient but not sapient incomplete. So then, looking at them with this in mind, we clearly see that they each carry defining characteristics, but rather than playing them off as one-note personalities, the game developed character arcs. These characters, simple as they are, change over time. Their one defining characteristic becomes something else, something greater, which drives them to accomplish the great things they do. And as each of their individual characters grow, they collectively develop one of the most important emotional entities of the story, hope which, interestingly enough, is also visually represented by the light shining into the levels, often from up and to the right. Thomas immediately starts off wanting to discover more. He's alone and wants to have more than this, more people, more experiences, more places. As time goes on, this curiosity develops, as it tends to, into a desire to not only understand how things work, but to make them better. Thomas's curiosity led him to knowledge, which gave him purpose, and he led his friends to the creation of a better world. Chris, on the other hand, is far more cynical. 
Where Thomas sees wondrous things to discover, Chris just sees another thing that's better than him. Being shorter and less capable of jumping, all anyone in this game seems capable of at this point, he doesn't feel much worth on his own. And this makes him resent anything that seems better than him, which at this point is basically everything. But later on, this is what allows him to sympathize with Laura so much. Their issues spring from different reasoning. Laura feels used, and Chris feels like no one needs to use him because they're all better than him, but the emotional result is quite similar, and Chris is able to relate to her lack of self-esteem. And in doing so, he gains meaning from her. He decides that he's going to do his part and do everything he can to help. His cynicism transforms into empathy. John is incredibly narcissistic. His whole existence at first is centered around how great he is, and his first instinct when he meets others is to show them what he can do. Maybe that's what the dots were for. They were there to extend John's reach, to make his performance even more impressive. John liked the thought. He decided to keep them. His ability to jump higher than the others is very useful, but almost as soon as we meet him, we see how he can still sometimes get in the way. And even then, he just laments that he doesn't have the room to show off. His revelation later is still kind of rooted in that self-centeredness, but moves beyond it with the realization that his greatness is meaningless without others to share it with. The first time in a while, John didn't have an audience. Leaping from black square to black square didn't seem nearly as exciting now, it just seemed empty. In a vacuum, how awesome he is doesn't actually mean anything. When he has no audience, when no one benefits from his skill, he has no purpose. And so he went from narcissism into community. His arc is fulfilled right before the end, and he realizes that he doesn't only want others to see how awesome he is, he wants them to feel awesome too. And if he can give them that awesomeness, he'll gladly do it. John's massive jumps were dwarfed by Sarah. For the first time in his life, he felt humbled, not as good as someone else. He realized that he wanted to make every AI up there feel as heroic as he had. Claire starts off with a very self-depreciative attitude. She was rubbish at jumping, and she moved slowly. She felt a little like her continued existence was breaking some kind of natural order. She's useless, she has nothing to offer, and she may as well accept her inevitable death, which is actually kind of dark. But hers is the fastest character arc, since it's completed basically as soon as you get to play her. She realizes she can float. No one else in this system can do that. She is unique. And rather than continuing to wallow in her uselessness, she decides to do everything she can to use her uniqueness to help others. Like a superhero. Her sadness at being powerless became a determination to help others when she realized she had even one unique thing that could do so. And that continues all the way to the end. Laura simply doesn't trust others. She goes along with things, but knows that everyone will leave her. I won't go too much into the metaphorical implications of everyone using her by bouncing on her then leaving, but I think it's safe to say she's meant to be the kind of character who has left herself too open and ended up only getting used. But when she meets friends that she can count on and works with them to get places, she begins to understand what healthy relationships are like. Working off one another, helping one another, and cooperating to reach even greater heights together. Her distrust becomes a willingness to cooperate when she experiences the mutual benefits of a healthy codependency with those who care about her. Now those are the original five, but James and Sarah are important too, as one of the quotes from the game is quick to remind us. They both each have their own character arcs, and their attributes are important to the events and the meaning of the third act. James was alone just like Thomas, and he had a uniqueness to him, just like Claire. But unlike Thomas, he wanted to be alone, because unlike Claire, he was insecure about his uniqueness. He had been ridiculed for it, made to feel as though this world was no place for him because he worked differently from others. When he met Thomas, he was amazed that they could work together and accomplish greater things. Cooperation with a friend like Thomas yielded results instead of ridicule, appreciation instead of hatred. James began to understand the value of his diversity, and began to appreciate the fact that his differences were not an unfortunate anomaly, but something he, and only he, could bring to help him and his friends succeed. James still felt weird, but he realized now that everyone else was too. They were a crew of weirdos. Weirdness that would save all the normals up above. The other AIs would escape, 
would all be down to seven rectangles with very different relationships to gravity. Sarah is a bit different in that she has a more detailed backstory as shown in the extra content to Benjamin's flight. I'll just focus on the main game for this analysis, but even just from that, we know that Sarah is aware of the internet uplink because of a blind square she used to know. And wow does she lord it over the others. This knowledge of something so important is reason enough for her to regard the others around her as lesser beings, ignorant peons who just aren't on her level. I feel like the elves from Lord of the Rings would tell her to calm down and check her hubris. When Thomas ends up being the one to connect to the internet, she's not happy about it. Thomas knows that she's screaming as he approaches it and she can't get anywhere near. Everything she had planned to achieve, the plan that made her so much better than everyone else, has now fallen to another. But with the passage of time and the help of her friends, she eventually comes to terms with this and realizes that who learns all that information isn't important. Their quest is. And even if she wishes it could have been her, she will support Thomas in his quest and accomplish what she had set out to do. So we can see how each of these characters has a fairly simple but still quite relatable character arc. They're all rather solid as story structure goes, so they work rather well as a result. Each of the characters has a simple defining characteristic that morphs into another one as they work through all of these trials with their friends by their side. So then, what does all this have to do with minimalism? I mean, a quick look at the game's art style and a lot of other elements of its presentation really reveal some very legitimate parallels to the artistic movement, but why did Mike Bithell choose that for this game? And how does it inform the story as a whole? Well, the easy answer is that the setting is very abstract already. It takes place in a computer mainframe. Everything is simple, not fully formed, and has no set visual way that it has to be portrayed. Beyond that, making the characters into actual humans may not have worked very well. It would screw up the mechanics, for one, and Laura's metaphorical subtext would have been a lot darker, and heck, Claire would have literally been an overweight girl with low self-esteem who floats in water. These character types just work a lot better with abstract concepts than with actual humans. It's also worth noting that the gameplay itself is both simple and symbolic. I mentioned before that the mechanics are based on friendship, and indeed, this simple platform puzzler is a very nice metaphor for friendship. The way we help each other, inspire each other, and occasionally cause problems for one another, it's all there in the mechanics. All the jumping around we were doing in this game is actually a metaphor for the very essence of what friendship is. But there's an even bigger reason for that. Thomas Was Alone is, in a broad sense, about the journey of something simple to something complex. About evolution, about progress, about simple beauty becoming a complex wonder through friendship, support, and determination. Remember when I said that minimalism was about simplifying something down to its core? Thomas Was Alone starts off with characters who are, by their very definition, as fragments, bits that would eventually become a full consciousness, minimalistic, and then that grow into something more. The minimalism in Thomas Was Alone is a metaphor for the characters themselves. Most people who play this game will talk about how it seems simple, all these little rectangles hopping around, but the story reveals so much more, and makes these simple quadrilaterals into lovable characters. And indeed, their simplicity gives way to complexity. And what's more, their simplicity combines into something else, something more, something complete. They spread their individual bits of humanity throughout the system, allowing them to affect the world and the AIs within it, making it possible for full, complete beings to come from this program. Thomas Was Alone introduces us to these characters as simple, minimalistic representations of fragments of the human psyche, then grows and combines them into, for all intents and purposes, humanity itself. And this is ultimately the greatest strength of Thomas Was Alone's narrative and its minimalist presentation. It introduces us to the simple, and takes us on a journey to the complex. It shows us how something so small can mean so much, and how we, and our friends, and family members, and all kinds of people, can make it happen. So I hope you've gained a deeper appreciation of Mike Biffle's little masterpiece, and can also further appreciate the meaning that video games can have, not just as toys or challenges, but as stories that can inspire people and help them grow. After all, if these little rectangles could come to mean so much, what's stopping some digital toys from the 70s from accomplishing the same? Next week, we return to Counterpoint to take on the argument that video games have art in them, but aren't actually art themselves, more like a museum than artworks in their own right. And next month on Literary Analysis, 
Would you kindly join me for an analysis of the themes and interactive narrative tools of Bioshock? So until next week, class dismissed.